I'm Marshall Kozloff. And I'm Mike Duran. Welcome back to Counterbalance. Hey, good morning, Marshall. And uh, hello to Rich Outson. Good to see you. Good to be here with you and, and with Marshall, Mike. Rich, with your permission, I'll just tell Marshall and our audience a little bit about you. Uh, uh, Marshall, uh, Rich is a kind of a throwback, I think, uh, to the kind of person that used to be very prevalent in, uh, um, in American national security circles. Here, here's one that'll send everybody to Wikipedia, like Vernon Walters. It's a sort of person. <laughs> that's, a, that's a reference most people won't get, I think. But uh, Rich is a career, was a career military officer. He retired at the rank of colonel. Um, he was a FAO. That's another thing that'll send people to Wikipedia. That's a foreign area officer. Rich has got extensive, uh, very extensive experience in the Middle East. He um, was deployed to Iraq, twice to Afghanistan. He speaks Hebrew, Arabic, and is totally fluent in Turkish, as far as I can tell. He has... Um, Enormous experience on the ground in the Middle East uh, dealing with security issues. He helped to train Palestinian security services back in, I don't know, around 2012, perhaps. But he's also got a lot of experience here in Washington, D.C. He was a military advisor on the policy planning staff under Secretary of State John Kerry and then stayed on um, under Rex Tillerson. And then after that, he was a senior advisor to Jim Jeffrey, the special envoy for Syria. So um, we're talking about uh, a person who knows the Middle East extremely well from the ground up, who understands the security issues in the, in, the, in the Middle East, but has also seen how these things are adjudicated at the highest levels of our politics back here in, uh, um, in Washington. That's a long introduction. He's also a native Californian from the Bay Area, and um, he tells me he's a 49ers fan, but I don't know what that means. Uh, so anyway, welcome again, Rich. It means six Super Bowls, hopefully this year. So, uh, <laughs> okay. thanks, thanks, Mike. It's really good to be here with you. Um, you, you are consistently one of the uh, people that I, I read and listen to on foreign affairs. And one of the great things about working in Washington on foreign policy is uh, learning from other people working in the field. We have a great community here, people in think tanks, academics, uh, journalists, and a lot of very dedicated and gifted people in uh, the bureaucracy, frankly, in Department of Defense, Department of State, the intelligence agencies, and uh, the opportunity to converse on these things that it's important, not just for the experts, but for, for the American people to know about is always a pleasure. And, and you see, Marshall, Rich is also a diplomat. Isn't that, isn't that nice? <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, um, Rich, let's just get started. Um, you know, what, I'll tell you what I find so interesting talking to you about is that I think uh, you're more seized than... Um, most people are by the uh, massive changes that have gone on in the last few years in the Middle East, but also in the American approach. I mean, we're we're living through an area, an area, an era. We're living through an era where uh, the United States is not going to be de as deeply involved on the ground, projecting military force, um, and that that's going to mean some real changes if we're going to remain influential in, in the Middle East. I wonder if you could just give us a few ideas of, uh, of how you think about that transformation. Sure, sure. So, you know, I came under active duty in the military um, service in 1989. It was right at the end of the Cold War. So I, I think the mindset I came in with, the, the imprint of, of being, um, you know, trained to view the world as this dichotomous contest between, you know, the West and the unfree world, totalitarian communism, uh, it was sort of an imprint on me. And I saw the vestiges of the Vernon Walters world that you referred to, one in which America had accepted both at the elite and popular levels that it had sort of a duty to organize the world. There was this, uh, you know, brilliant explosion at the beginning of my military career when we had the war in Iraq. Uh, we had the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the reintegration of or reunification of Germany. And then we had this unipolar fantasy in the 90s where we thought all of a sudden history was over and there wasn't going to be a lot of organizing that had to be done uh, because, frankly, everybody saw that we were the cool model and, and wanted to be like us. Uh, the 90s with Somalia and Bosnia, um, the, the slow ascent of China, which is slow at that time, sort of uh, should have given us some warning signs that, that maybe 
it wasn't going to be all that easy. And then 9-11 uh, happened. And 9-11 and was, of course, one of the fu uh, fundamental or foundational moments in all of our professional careers, those of us who look at foreign policy and security. So as sometimes happens for America, we oscillated between a, a sort of triumphalism and uh, maybe a little hint of isolationism at the beginning of the Bush years. You remember uh, George Bush came in to office saying, I'm not going to make the mistake of that Clinton guy. I, I, I'm not going to uh, go on these wild adventures everywhere. But, you know, they say that everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face and we got punched in the face. So, so then we tried to organize the world um, through direct imposition of democracy or, or at least uh, direct imposition of counterterrorism with a facade of democracy. And that was, you know, it, evident in the, in the Israel-Palestinian uh, peace process, in our attempt to stabilize and, and change Afghanistan and, and most uh, markedly, of course, in the Iraq war. But we got burned. Right. Because these were all big, big lifts. And at the same time that we were trying to do these things and not deploying adequate resources to do them. And maybe we could have done one of those things. Right. But we tried to do a bunch all, all at once. Uh, the result was uh, suboptimal results, to be kind, in all of them, uh, which means that by the time that Obama comes around as president, the, the primary thinking was to abjure all interest in organizing the system and to sort of say, let's focus on on what's going on at home. So we are, in my view, just now getting used to the fact of multipolarity in the Middle East especially, but also globally. And, and China is now a peer competitor, which it wasn't when we started this, this process you know, that I've described in 90, 91, 92. And Russia has resurged and played a weak hand, frankly, very, very well. And the American people are going through one of these uh, exercises in uh, self-examination, and sort of internal division that we go through periodically as well. And I'm, you know, troubled by that uh, in, in many ways as a conservative, but also as a foreign policy uh, practitioner and analyst, I just noticed that this, this means you're not going to be organizing the world very effectively when you are going through some uh, soul searching and, and some paroxysms at home. So that's kind of how I think, you know, I, I would describe where we're at in the cycle. We, we're returning to a multipolarity that we haven't seen since before World War II. And we're having some growing pains getting adjusted to it. You know, we were discussing ideas for this episode before we started the recording, and you made a really interesting point, arguing that grand strategy is fictional in democracies. And the reason why I'm bringing this up now is everything you just described from the post-Cold War war to the challenges of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to multipolarity would lead a lot of people to say, okay, cool, time for a new grand strategy. We had a grand strategy after World War II. We need a new one now. So can you explain why that inclination, at least from your perspective, is incorrect? Sure. So as a practitioner you know, of national security, as a lieutenant on a across this time, and especially as someone who did a lot of time focused on uh, the Middle East, as I, I became a specialist in the Middle East, a foreign area officer, uh, starting in roughly 97, 98, I saw what looked to me like a steady deterioration of our position there. And it's not that we, we weren't applying the instruments of national power. We were using diplomatic capital, money, uh, in some cases, military force, and yet we did not seem to be achieving our, our policy aims or political goals. In the military, we're taught this triangular sort of uh, structure uh, of how strategy works. At the bottom, you have tactics. In the middle, you have the operational art, which is stringing together tactical engagements and operations to achieve a campaign effect. And above that, you have strategy, which is sort of at the regional or, or occasionally, if we get very ambitious at the global level, trying to weave together the operational effects into a, a political aim. But for the military man or woman, you, you, you don't always ask the question, what's above that? I mean, so if strategy at the top of the pyramid is the correlation of ends, ways, and means, who picks the ends, right? Who, who is it that actually says this is what we're going to do? Now, Kissinger might, might have called it statecraft. I think Brzezinski as well. But at the end of the day, um, it's fundamentally different in a democracy than it is in an autocracy. Because in a democracy, the people determine the politics and the politics determines the policy. So Grand strategy is, I call it a branch of fiction, because it's the assumption that above this triangle, above strategy, that there's a grand strategy, which is also a rational, consistent, forward-looking process that is comprehensively debated among experts, uh, coordinated across the entirety of government, and that we sort of stick to it. And none of those things are true. In reality, it's episodic. 
uh, it's often mutually contradictory. At least every four years, we seem to, to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction on at least a couple of these things. And that's by design. Our founders did not want us to have an efficient imperial management structure because we had just come from that and we wanted to be a republic. And we still struggle with the responsibilities of a global empire, uh, some of which we still have, um, with the, the domestic uh, makeup and character of a republic. So I, I think uh, when I started getting really fascinated in policy was when I realized that our policies were all failing. And you know, you can we we could have another discussion about why policies fail and you know the very human aspects of policy making. But may, maybe I'll just say this about that: of the three possibilities about how policy comes about, that it is rational and well determined, like academic strategies, which is sometimes called rational policy model, or at the other end, uh, what Mankur Olson called the garbage can model, that that on any given day you just kind of reach into the political can and whatever's popular and doable and maybe might make the person pursuing it politically more successful, you pull out and that's what we follow, which is very frightening because that means there's no real uh, predictability to it. I think the middle position is what's called the multiple streams model uh, by John Kingdon. And, and Kingdon basically said, there's a steady stream of problems, there's a steady stream of solutions, and then there's a steady st uh, stream of political opportunity. And there's windows that open up when those three intersect. And the art of good policy, uh, you can get a little bit of consistency if you understand where those three line up, and you have a couple of principles you pursue through throughout an administration or, or maybe a couple. So I think that's why the, uh, the constant search for rational and well-crafted grand strategy should be restricted to classrooms and research uh, labs, because it's certainly not going to happen in the political world. So a lot of my experience in government confirms everything you just said, but, but uh, <laughs> no, I remember when I when I when I I went into the White House from academia, I got my first government experience was in the White House. Uh, great for me. I'm not sure how good it was for the nation, but uh, I I do remember how naive I was when I got to the NSC. I did imagine these closed door meetings where guys at the top would debate strategy, and then I and I, and then I would see what came out of our process. It, documents that we called strategy documents, which were basically to-do lists, you know, <laughs> the president should call the prime minister of Israel or, you know, like <laughs> that's, it's not a strategy. Tactics, it's just, a, yeah. just a, yeah, not, not even tactics, not, not even just, just a menu of, of to-do items. Um, but um, I, I do wonder though, let, let me, let me, let me play devil's advocate here a bit. Um, if we're talking about the Middle East, we have to admit that m most Americans, and foreign policy in general, but the, this is the, the area I know best is the Middle East. Americans are not really tracking m most of what goes on. Most Americans who most voters are not tracking closely what goes on in the Middle East. Now, obviously, if the uh, United States starts a war or if there's an, a major attack like 9-11, you know, everybody starts paying very close attention. Um, but most of the time... As, as as you just described, I'm not familiar with the author you mentioned. Was it Kingdon, did you say? Yeah, Kingdon. About the, the, multiple streams. The, 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 the multiple streams. That's the way it is most of the time. And the people handling those streams are, re are really doing it outside of the purview of the electorate or, or, or considerably outside of the purview of the electorate. And that opens up a space um, for... Uh, for strategy by experts. And it even opens up a space where you can have, uh, you know, from, uh, from administration to administration continuities that might actually, that, that might be kind of surprising. Uh, you, you know, I can, I can point out very considerable continuities. Uh, I don't like to do it for all kinds of reasons, but uh, I can point out considerable continuities between uh, George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump. And so on. Some, uh, uh, um, depending upon what 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 area we're talking about. So doesn't that open up then a space for um, uh, for uh, for strategy and for and and make some of those what you're describing as um, you know academic uh, discussions actually kind of relevant. Yeah, King, actually, Kingdon allowed for that. Kingdon uh, re referred to these windows uh, that I talked about earlier, and he said the windows are only relevant if there's what he called a policy entrepreneur who can fill that 
uh, by bringing the streams together. Now, the, the problem is if a policy entrepreneur is working in isolation from other broad swaths of the policy community, then you're not going to have continuity. But when we do see continuity, that's when the magic happens. If a policy entrepreneur does a, a, a pretty good diagnosis of a world situation, a regional situation, a problem, and then uh, gives the prescription. So good policy needs both diagnosis and prescription. And if you can convince people that your diagnosis is right and you give a reasonable prescription, that opens the door for cross-cutting alliances. And you know, I, you and I are probably both old enough to remember the Blue Dog Democrats and and uh, sort of conservative pro-defense Democrats. And, yes. And even liberal Republicans, people who would, would be more globalist and internationalist in outlook, and that opens some permutations. the The problem is that when you're domestically, and I talked about this cycle of domestic sort of um, introspection, we'll call it. Uh, but when you go through the polarization process that has accompanied our introspection those cross-cutting uh, doors and windows get closed. And and then what we have is a more violent swing from one to the other. But yes, I agree. There, there's absolutely some things. And this, in a sense, is the ghost of Mahan and Mackinder, right? Because we, we don't like to talk about geopolitics for a number of reasons, but there are some geopolitical truths based on continuities of geography and competitive strategy and of history. And on some of those things, like not allowing a single hegemon to dominate Eurasia, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. And, and right. those sorts of things. Right. And I think in Iran, our Iran policy, you've seen across Democratic and Republican administrations, broad continuity, uh, you know, up until <laughs> the, the, the JCPOA era. And even many of the Democrats I know, frankly, I, had problems with JCPOA as well. So there are threads. We just haven't been very talented, I think, in, in tying those together with the appropriate strategic tools. Wait, why do you say that we don't like to talk about geopolitics? That's a great question. So um, geopolitics is actually talked about quite a bit in the loose sense. And I think if you look at, at uh, popular press, they talk about geopolitics from a number of ways. The academic study of geopolitics is another matter. Uh, the original school of geopolitics or schools, if you will, so the Mackinder, Mahan, Spike, Minkellen, Haushofer, was associated with imperial politics in the uh, pre World War II and World War II eras, and over time got a bad name in the academy because of its misappropriation by fascists in Japan and in Germany. So by the 50s and 60s, geopolitics was largely replaced with you know concepts of statesmanship and, and strategy, especially in the nuclear era. Uh, and frankly, as long as the Cold War went on, we looked at, at most international affairs through this ideological East versus West and, and uh, free world versus totalitarian world uh, paradigm. But in fact, context matters a lot. And as the Cold War system broke down, ge geography reasserted itself and the different dynamics that play in the Middle East as opposed to Europe, for instance, uh, became relevant again. Now, right about that time in the 1990s, actually, there was a wave of, of uh, critical uh, thinkers. So critical theory, uh, just like critical race theory, there's different uh, schools of critical thought. There was a critical turn in geopolitical theory that basically said, no, no, none of that's important. The, the geography and so forth, all these theories people put out based on geopolitics are not important. All that's important is what they reveal about the imperialist and and um, sort of atavistic impulses of those pursuing it. So it's a power discourse that geopolitics is just a way, uh, I, I call it imperial mansplaining, right? It's just a way to justify- You should coin that. There's something, <laughs> <laughs> there's a brand you can so put on that. It's only recently, again, after we've been punched in the nose a couple times that you see the reemergence of, of geopolitics as a legitimate academic discipline. So yes, in the loose, you're right, in the loose term uh, and in a loose manner, it's been applied, but people don't go very deep in it. But in the deep thinking about how to have a uniquely American geopolitics, that's something we're really just starting to grapple with again in the last five, six years. Do you think that it uh, that it's deep, deep in our nature as a people that we're just not very good at, at geopolitics? I, I watched um, the Azerbaijani-Armenian war last year very closely, um, as I'm sure you did too. And... Uh, the guy that I marveled at the most was Putin, uh, b because uh, um, Putin understood, I think, from moment one, exactly what he needed, the little sliver of territory that he needed to control in order to remain 
uh, uh, not the hegemonic force, but the dominant guy, the guy that, or let's just say the guy that everybody had to go to, to get what they wanted. And it didn't, it didn't take much. It didn't take much. And he knew it all along. He knew it from the beginning. It's the, the, for those of you who followed it, the, the Lechen corridor, it's the key little place and he's there now. <laughs> and it's just, I, 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 uh, I, I, I watched that and I thought it's not possible that the United States can behave in that way. We have all this power. We're so much more powerful than Russia, but we can never just kind of identify, you know, that one little, that one little soft spot where we, we stick our finger there and everybody and our adversary collapses or, or that little spot where we can just, we, we can just sit on the, on the hill and our guns point down at everybody else. I, I, am I wrong about that? Can we learn that? Or is that in our nature somewhere? Well, or is I don't it know something about nature, us? Because we, we weren't always bad at it. But but we are bad at it now. So what, what you're talking about is the ability to apply these different tools of national power and achieve a specific political outcome. And I would argue that uh, sort of as the culmination of the Cold War, we did that in 1991 because mm. you know, we, we applied a, a bunch of power. We, we played a power projection game. We had some very carefully crafted uh, demands, which was to get Saddam out of out of Kuwait. Uh, and then we fought a limited military campaign with a broad coalition. We did a fantastic job of messaging and cobbling together that coalition. And we applied a precise amount of military force that both provided an a object lesson that increased our deterrence for a decade and also got the goal that we wanted without collapsing a state and creating a vacuum. I would argue that that was a, a pretty skilled geopolitical maneuver. Uh, Putin's pretty good at it at, at, at this time, and he has, as you've noted, you know, sort of a weaker hand in terms of the economics and even the military strength than we do, but he seems to be getting his political goals. I, I think part of this is related to our, our introspective cycle, but the other thing is that there are, it took a long time for us to get good at this in the Cold War era, and we did get good at it, but it's three, geography is three things, or sorry, geopolitics is three things that we're not particularly good at. And I, I get this definition from uh, Colin Gray and um, Sloan, with whom he's written a book about it. It is the intersection of history, geography, and competitive politics. Well, Americans are largely a historical people because w w our national creed is essentially based on reinvention, right? Everybody came to America from somewhere else. And the idea with, of our civic identity is that we create ourselves a historically, that, that we essentially are a nation that's in development and definition every year or at least every four years. The second is is uh, geography. So not only are we a historical, we're a geographical, because we're a global uh, power, and, and and we we've got two neighbors, and none, none of them threaten us much, at least not for the last 150 years. So we we don't feel the immediacy either of local problems or local opportunities. That's why we think globally, and and the textured what the Germans called Fingerspitzengefühl, you know, the the textured sense of each place's unique threats and opportunities is not so immediate for us. And then the third is competitive strategy. So I, I would say that we are so used to being top dog and not feeling threatened by others that it's almost like foreign policy is a matter of what we choose to do. Uh, right. Not, not what, you know, and, and that's not really the case because we have real constraints, not reading yeah. those constraints and playing that hand. Well, that's a problem. And so I, I don't know if it's in our nature, as you say, but, but I, I would say it's definitely something we have a challenge with. Yeah, and I actually think we can tie this together with something you said earlier, because Mike, you're referencing Russia and making that smart tactical play. And earlier, Rich, you said playing a when you have a weak hand, that's the type of move you have to really make. And as we're thinking about your earlier point about entering a multipolar world, I'm just thinking about this in the context of the US because I'm almost 30, so I'm just about as young as you can be and still remember that pre- multipolar world, really 1990s, um, early 2000s, all of that part. So how much does the transition to multipolarity under your framework really affect the way the U.S. is going to have to handle those sort of tactical opportunities or even costs? Well, it's not, uh, it's a great question. And I, I think multi, we can, we've adjusted emotionally, but not intellectually to multipolarity. And by that, I mean, um, after going through what we went through in Iraq and Afghanistan and the, the peace process and all that, I think we've come to realize that many of these problems we can't solve. And so that that's an important step on the path to manipulating a multipolar system. Uh, but the problem is that we've sort of come to the conclusion that none of it's worth 
us actually exerting force to fix at all. So that that's a step maybe too far. And the whole leading so, from behind, sorry. And not to, not to interrupt because you actually set up a really fascinating dichotomy. So your, your point is emotionally, especially during the 2010s post Syria, Americans have adjusted at least on a feelings level to we can't just impose, you can't yes. just do this, this or that. But then we're then stuck right where you're basically picking up. Cause I just wanted to really highlight that important. Cause that's, that's really interesting that the, the, the emotional aspect of that and how that could translate or hasn't translated to policy. Yeah. Well, you know, and part of it is that, you know, we had this vision that we need to get rid of, um, that the world was post national post state, that corporations mattered and small social organizations mattered, but really the, the nation state was decreasing. Uh, and, and this was sort of a, a overlap between the nineties and the aughts. Uh, and this was tied, by the way, to the decreasing uh, familiarity with geopolitics. But in fact, nation states still matter a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, the next step in our evolution has to be reimagining how we deal with nation states. Because right now, through our course of diplomacy and, and, and how we handle our alliances, it's sort of a black and white proposition. You're either with us or against us. If you're against us, we're going to sanction you and not talk to you. Uh, and if we're with us, we expect you to do exactly what, what we are asking you to do. But the reality is much more gray than that. And we have a problem with gray. And learning to work and deal with uh, sort of mid-sized powers, and I, I think Mike and I would, would probably, the Turkey would come to mind for us when we think about this, that, that offer strong uh, geopolitical advantages as an ally, but are very difficult for other reasons because they're gray in terms of, you know, the form of democracy that we'd like to see practiced. This is a problem. Um, but effectively solving problems in the world means working with gray actors and in some cases, uh, nation states for very specific purposes without implying either another rejection or another endorsement of that state. So to me, that's the psychological step, recognizing emotionally that you can't do it all yourself and that the world's not evolving as we would have it so that globalization is not what we thought it was. That's good. But, but the necessary step is to say, okay, I'm going to hold my nose and work with some of these people for better outcomes, not ideal outcomes. And by the way, that is a replication of what we did in the Cold War. And in, over the course of the Cold War, uh, we came to, to have some very pragmatic steps. And I, you know, I'm not going to try to um, justify or or defend things like you know overthrowing the Allende government in Chile or things like that. We did a lot of things that, from a democratic perspective were suboptimal. But what we did in the end is we won the major geopolitical struggle. And I don't think anyone could argue that that result was not beneficial for humanity, at least not any mainstream thinkers, because technology, economy, human rights, the general course of human history was improved by the fact that it was the West and not the totalitarian East, at least in Europe, that, that won that. I, I will tack on to that the, the um, observation others have made that the Cold War is really not over in Asia uh, be, because we still have a major totalitarian state there. So the work remains undone. We had a touchdown uh, victory dance going on for about two decades, uh, but but the work is really only half done. Your answer to that question, that is uh, uh, such an intelligent and um, uh, articulate description of what I think my, uh, my intellectual project is. If I, uh, uh, if somebody asked me what I'm, you know, what, what I'm trying to do, um, it's exactly what you just said. How many of us, I actually, I'm going to, Marshall, if you permit, I'm going to, I want to ask Rich two questions on this round, but first of all, how many of us are there out there who think like this? Well, there's more of us over 50 <laughs> than, there are, than there are under 50. Yeah. Uh, and, That's unfortunate. And, and, uh, who was it? You know, there's an old aphorism that, that soldiers frequently hear that I will be a soldier so that my son can be an engineer, so that his son can be an artist. Yeah, um, this is a, a variation on Ibn Khaldun's, you know, four generation rise and fall of societies, Gibbon and, and others. I, I'm a long cycle. Uh, I, I put it like I, I have the three generations of, uh, you know, in, in business formation. There's the founder of the business and then the son expands it. And then the and then the grandson snorts cocaine and uh, um, and buys fast cars. <laughs> So, right. And, and so the, uh, maybe the, uh, even the neatest way to say it is that hard times make good men, uh, good men make good times, good times make bad men. Right. So, <laughs> so this is, I, you know, and that, that's, of course, it's a very over 50 sort of thing to say, 
but the the problem is the largesse uh, in terms of economic dominance prosperity and world leadership that we achieved through victory in the cold war led to a certain stasis right and and, and the idea that um there are no dragons to be slayed it's it's all just one world if we if we just kind of keep the status quo but the status you know the world doesn't stay in status quo and there be dragons and the dragons are moving so i i think there will be more i think uh, marshall's generation there's a number of people out there and I, you know, I'm, I'm reading it and it's, it's not just a Republican Democrat or left, right thing. I think there's people on both sides that are starting to grapple um, with, with the nature of, of the world as it is when you're not in a unipolar moment and that not all these things can just be sort of engineered out. So I think the number is actually going to be increasing and I, I we're a minority uh, because look in a country like the United States that is so vast, so affluent and used to leadership. It's frankly, you know, it's a very long-term investment to think in geopolitical terms and, and to think in terms of, of threats and long-term investments to, to mitigate those threats. But once those threats creep a little closer and you start experiencing, and, and the seventies were such a moment, right? If we remember that, mm -hmm. um, where we had friendly regimes falling, you know, the Soviets on the march in Afghanistan, gas prices through the roof in the United States, the, the problems of the world started to impact our lives at home. And as that happens, the number of people who think like you and me will increase. Uh, but there got to be some bad times to create that character. I want to go back to something. I'm going to keep doing this. You say really interesting things I want to pull tidbits out of. You were making reference to needing to make concessions with different regimes in ways that might not feel great, but are accomplishing our broader strategic goals. Like what are examples? So two things then. So what are examples of those countries, regimes, et cetera? And then what are the issues at that are causing us to have to make those decisions in the first place? So probably let's, let's just split that in half. Let's start with what are the what are the choice strategic choices we're facing that is pushing up putting us in this position? Then we'll get to the specific countries after that. Okay. Um so I think rather than picking the what specific policies and countries I would give concessions on, because that's showing your hand pre-negotiation, <laughs> let, let, me, let me just answer it maybe with, with a, a, a theoretical observation, that we try to coerce our ways into policy success. Coercive diplomacy as a field you know, consists of all actions we take, military, uh, economic, diplomatic, informational, cyber, to try to achieve policy change in another country. And uh, the study, of course, of diplomacy shows that it's not a high confidence strategy. It usually fails. Why does it fail? Because you have to be, you know, there's a certain set of conditions. And one is it has to be a reasonable ask that the other side thinks uh, that they can give in on. And it's not going to lead to a, a undoing of their entire position. Second, it depends upon a threat that you make credible and are willing to follow through on and have a good track record of following through on. Third, a sequence of escalating the sense of urgency. And fourth, an off-ramp. So... I think that we have engaged in coercion. Uh, oh, one of their empirical fact is that coercion is more likely to work against your friends than against your enemies. Why? Because enemies figure that you're not really coercing for the specific policy ask, but you're trying to undermine their entire position, either as a prelude to destabilization or war. Whereas your friends kind of know it's really about that thing you're trying to coerce them on. You're not really trying to undo them altogether. But I think because we got so burned in the 2000s uh, through the direct application of military force and sort of broad ideological projects like, like building democracy in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, that we have turned to coercive diplomacy as a way of sort of modulating, you know, like a rheostat on all of our friends and all of our enemies. And the it's been, I think, Kathy Gil Gilsonen in the Atlantic called a boom time for, in a 2019 article, boom time for sanctions. Our number of sanctions has more than doubled uh, since the end of the 2000s, you know, the 2010 to now. We're doing military coercion, working with sub-state actors in a number of different places, like with you know the YPG in Syria. So I, I think um, in several of the countries that I follow, and much of Eurasia, we have come to be seen as the coercing power. Now, the truth is, we're not the only power that coerces. The Chinese coerce as well, but they're a little more selective about what they coerce on, because they frankly don't give a darn about the nature of your regime or if you repress your journalists. They, they will coerce for very specific uh, political and economic goals. Now, I'm not saying we should act like China, but what I'm saying is we've become somewhat profligate in our use of sanctions and other coercive tools. 
So I'm not actually saying we should make concessions to countries that are not in our interest, but we should be a little bit more choosy about what sorts of um, activities or regime characteristics we're trying to uh, punish. Because for instance, when we punish Turkey and Azerbaijan and some of our Gulf allies, when we have one that really matters to us, which is the Iranian nuclear program, you're going to have a harder time building a coalition to get that one act of really important coercion done if you've sanctioned about half the people that you need to get on board to make that one work. So we're casting too broad a net and we're trying to inflict incremental amounts of pain on too many people as a replacement for genuine diplomacy and genuine military force when it's needed. So that's what I would, that, that's really what I meant is that I, I think that this low cost, cheap talk, throw a bunch of sanctions out and convince everybody that we're a punitive power. When in rea reality, China and Russia are probably more punitive. It's just they don't advertise it the way that we do, and they tend not to do it against their friends. That's a bad way to manage the international system. So that, that, that's really what I meant. Uh, yeah, you see like right now, today, how ridiculous it is that our officials are sitting down in Vienna moving toward, they haven't done it yet, but it's pretty clear that they're going to lift all sanctions on Iran, which is at a moment when it is actually uh, bombing through proxies, our forces in Iraq, bombing through proxies, the Israelis and the Saudis, uh, and engaged in any number of other activities, killing journalists there, uh, that we, um, that we, uh, abhor among our friends and sanction them for it, 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 it. If you're sitting in, if you're sitting in the Middle East and looking at America and trying to figure out wh what America is up to, it's it, it's impossible to it's impossible to make any kind of coherent sense out of. I mean, you can do it if you know our politics and have followed the debate and everything. But but looking at it from a distance without all that information, it looks just crazy. It's a per it's a perverse incentive for sure. It, it sure looks like. If you try to blow up American soldiers and if you try to destabilize American allies uh, anywhere in the world, that ultimately we're going to negotiate with you and make concessions to you. That's the wrong sort of concession to make. Whereas if you're a longstanding ally or someone who does something uh, that might be in our geopolitical interest, but not sort of in the way we, that we want you to, uh, that you're probably more at risk for sanctions. And and I think that that, um, that coercive balance is something we need to, to relook at. I think mean, that's a good way of putting it. So I'm trying to find a good way to sum all this up because it's very, very helpful. I think rather than push you on a very specific set of recommendations, for the listener who's thinking about the frameworks we're talking about here, what are some of the questions and choices that people should be looking at moving forward, given the implications of all of this? So given the implications of a multipolar world, given the implications of, as you said, globalization not quite going the way that we really wanted to or thought it was going, what are just the open questions that everyone should be focused on? Yeah, well, I, so I, I am, as I mentioned, sort of a relic of the Cold War, although that has uh, some baggage that's helpful and some that doesn't, I suppose. But one thing that, that is a foundational element of my thought that dates from that time is the importance of alliances. And I think a formal alliance commitment means something. And I think that um, we all need to think about the difference with alliance partners between must have and nice to have. And I think that the way that we deal, deal with some of our, and I'm not saying blank check for allies, not, not at all. I, I think a friend should be able to criticize and, and cajole and incentivize things. But I think that we've badly undermined, and this goes for Democrats and Republicans, badly undermined confidence of our partners and allies that we will be a constant Right. So that so that commitment to the United States um, is something that you can kind of take to the bank. And I, I think that rethinking how valuable because, by the way, if you don't want your soldiers and, and uh, sailors and Marines and, and airmen all over the world and you don't want to pay for reconstruction of all these different countries, you've got to have people that are willing to partner with you on it. And people are less likely to partner with us when we're threatening, sanctioning and cajoling. So we need sort of uh, a, a bipartisan approach to alliance maintenance. And I, uh, I I don't, you know, it's not just the multilateral bigs like NATO, but but also the individual relationships. And the second is, um, you know, I, we need to firmly think in geopolitical terms, and that means the course of history, um, thinking in terms of historical precedent. 
what is likely to happen. It was Mark Twain once who said that history may not repeat itself, but it sure rhymes a lot. Um, we're going to see a lot of rhyming. We need to know the patterns that are unique to each of the regions of the world that are interest to, uh, interesting to us. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, the third thing I'll say is I'm not going to totally um, malign the idea that sometimes we shouldn't intervene. You know, I, I don't want to, uh, to be a global activist power trying to solve all the world's problems, but the way of, of <laughs> this leading from behind issue where you, where you actually uh, hold forth and, and sermonize on everything, you just don't act on it. I think that's the wrong way to go about that. I, I think certain things you have to delegate uh, to local partners and you can you can help them to work through. And I don't mean local sub-state actors. I mean other governments that you recognize have a stake. And, um, I, you know, I, I think we talk a big talk uh, and then we undercommit in terms of follow through. And that's that's a matter of praxis. The first point was about geopolitical thinking. That's a cultural change we need in bipartisan. The second or this, uh, the third actually here that I've just discussed is really a matter of praxis. Um, so that those would be things that uh, at a policy and elite level, uh, I, I think are worthy projects. And uh, in just in terms of what maybe the layman or the non-academic or non-policy expert can do, I, you know, I, I think it's very much in the American tradition to think in terms of good investments. What are we getting out of these things? You know, and, and President Trump did this, for instance, you know, the America first premise, although, it, you know, it, it's widely uh, criticized in many areas because it, it done awkwardly, it can undercut the alliance motif uh, and the alliance ethic. But we should, for every expenditure of national effort, have a clear interest and have leaders who can articulate those things. And I don't mean in terms of, you know, ideological frames. I mean, in terms of actual benefit to our businesses, to our people and to our security. In essence, let me put a you know a little chapeau on all of that by saying we need to be a little bit more hard headed about our foreign policy, uh, a little bit less um, prone to the illusions either of right or left, and we need to reforge a bipartisan consensus uh, you know based on this hard headed approach. You you are almost saying, Rich, you're 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 this close, and I'm holding up my forefinger and my thumb with a little space there. You're this close to saying we need a national strategy. Wait, 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 catch, before, you, catch. Before, you, before, you, before you respond to that, l let me say, I, I took your point earlier that it's hard to do strategy, but we can, but we can come up with kind of maxims like no single power should be dominant in Eurasia and, 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 uh, and so forth. So, be, before you before you defend yourself against the uh, against the claim that you just made <laughs> you just made a pitch for the need for national strategy um after you after you defend yourself on that can you give us some maxims that take us a little bit closer down to 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 you know to, to tactics but sort of enduring principles that we should be um uh that we should be following with regard to the middle east especially Sure. Well, it was Jack Welch uh, to respond to the accusation you've you mercilessly layered against me. Uh, it was Jack Welch who said, "Culture eats strategy for breakfast," and I think what I am calling for is a national security culture, not not a national security strategy, because strategy is instrumental. It's it's not teleological. Strategy never tells you what you want to get to, right? It's instrumental in, a, in that it tells you how to get to where you want to get. It's a cultural decision about what kind of power we want to be. So what I'm really saying is the United States needs to reconceptualize how we want to lead a multipolar system. And to me, that's a change in strategic culture rather than in strategy. So uh, the strategies will change over time. But the problem is we're still very reticent to conceive of ourselves in the middle. You know, there's a portion of the U.S. strategic community or, or foreign policy community, if you want to call it that, who thinks that we should be the unchallenged single dominant power of the world. And, and uh, there's a, another that think that we should... Just let the system be the system. Well, the middle position is we need to have a very hard-headed approach to being the primus inter pares, keeping in mind that some states like Iran call for our destruction and, and that other, other states like China are acting to subvert us every single day. We need to be very clear-eyed about that. And, and that kind of stuff we should not tolerate, especially not attacks on our infrastructure and, and on our social cohesion. So we need to be punching back uh, at, at the appropriate way. But at the end of the day, it's a culture. It's a culture of leadership for the 21st century that's not 
sort of this um, overly optimistic uh, one world globalism. Everybody just follow us. And, and that's wishing away problems. And it's not a, you know, a pox upon all their houses. We're not going to lead anything. It's that middle position that I want to see us develop a culture for. Maxims uh, to support that. Well, maxims are hard to um, extemporize, but I, I would say um, that a laser-like focus on maintaining military primacy and not not dominance, not supremacy. We don't have to have occupations going of multiple countries in the world, but technological uh, advantage in war matters a lot. And of all the elements of national power that we've discussed, you know, and, and there's soft power and ideology matter, economic power matters, but at the end of the day, we're in a hard power world. And failure to adequately resource and maintain uh, technological and operational primacy is a big problem. So our ability to fight medium-sized wars, big wars if we have to, uh, naval engagements, littoral engagements, I, I, I think that's very important. And we shouldn't think that just because we haven't been punched in the nose for a couple of years that it's not coming. So that's the first maxim is uh, maintain primacy. The second maxim would be uh, Im improve and extend alliances. And when you have within your alliances, if you have problems, you try to solve those using discrete means. And by the way, as you know, Mike, you and I talk about Turkey a lot. Turkey's been, in many regards, a problematic ally for many U.S. presidents. I get that. That's not actually new. They've always been problematic. And by the way, we're problematic for them as well. But I've seen the sorts of subtle bargaining and, yes, coercion done in a way that does not uh, politically damage either side. And I've seen it work. I've seen it done on a couple of different occasions spanning a couple of different decades. There are ways that good statesmen with some economic tools, both incentives and disincentives, and some and some military things that you can dangle for, for good or for ill, uh, can wisely help recalcitrant allies and sometimes recalcitrant enemies make decisions that we would like them to do. So uh, military primacy, smart use of alliance structures and maintenance of those structures, and third, which I've sort of already referred to, is a... a uh, more judicious use of the coercive powers that we seem to be very broadly but very ineffectively using. To me, those three maxims are how we uh, reestablish a hard-headed and geopolitically successful uh, posture in the coming decade. Rich, I think that's an excellent place to leave things. Is there anything that you'd like to shout out to the audience, any work that's relevant where people should follow you on social media or just in general? We'd just love to get a good rundown of all that. Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm uh, at Rich Outson at uh, Twitter, and I post a fair number of things there. I have an, a forthcoming piece uh, with the Washington Institute that's uh, focused on Turkish power projection, um, and we'll be ramping up um, some other products soon. But uh, I'll, I'll be in touch to let you know if I get a website going. That, that's uh, I'm fresh enough off of government service. Uh, that I'm, I'm really just swimming in the shallows at this point. Uh, but I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come talk with you guys. And I, I think that this probably won't be the last time. I think so too. I, I have one more thing I want to hit with you before you go. It just um, that I think, uh, um, I, first of all, I want to thank you. That was a very, very intelligent and coherent explanation of a worldview. Fantastic. Um I, I think there's one issue that I, I heard you saying, but it, it, did, it didn't get emphasized. I just want to get your reaction to it before we close out. And that's, um, you're also making a case for uh, the role of the statesman, uh, of the individual, that, um, that the, the personnel at the top really matters. There's a lot of room for individual initiative in these structures that we're talking about. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, the, I think maybe the, the greatest example I can give from personal experience is working with the master James Jeffrey. As you know, I, I advised him for a couple of years on um, his attempts to, to resolve the Syrian um, crisis. This was a, a man, is a man, uh, who was a combat veteran, Vietnam era, eight years in the Army, three-time ambassador, and also a, a uh, deputy national security advisor. So he came back after six years of retirement to work on a top level national policy priority uh, for Secretary Pompeo. I, the reason I mention him is because he's an example uh, of the requirement for the primacy of civilian 
policy thinkers. Now, yes, he had been in the military, but the problem with a, a foreign policy that's essentially dominated just by people in uniform with the episodic and intermittent attention of politicals is that the military is like the proverbial man with a hammer to whom everything looks like a nail. I'm not saying that they want to go to these different places to look for military solution, but that is what they do. And so give them a problem and they will try to find a military solution to it. The integration of the other tools, economic, informational, diplomacy, and negotiations really falls to a very small set of people, uh, ambassadors, policy professionals at the NSC, and some senior administration officials, advised by you know what I think um, Ben Rhodes called the blob, <laughs> that have to come up with creative solutions to all this. But it can be done. And so I... I think if there were one thing that would make it more frequent that we would have talented statesmen or stateswomen that would, would do this sort of thing, it is breaking down that barrier between uh, military experience and, uh, and civilian experience and not just leaving the work of international strategy to the, um, to the military. I can't remember who said this, but it has been said, uh, well, that any nation that leave, that insists on a separation between its soldiers and its scholars is doomed to have its uh, thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. And I think that we, we don't have sufficient cross-pollinization of those groups. James Jeffrey is my sort of uh, prime example of how that should be. And I know lots of people who can do that uh, if they're not stifled uh, sort of by the, the political climate. And uh, again, that's a building bridge between civilian and military. That's the second bridge I've talked about. The first was the bridge between left and right on a strategic consensus about hard-headed approach. Uh, but we we know that there is a role um, for individual statesmanship because in its absence, we see the problems multiply. So yes, that, that matters. Uh, this, the geopolitics doesn't mean that there's no role for human agency. Great. And yeah, I just want to reiterate again, thanks so much, Rich. We'll definitely have you back in the future because we are not going to resolve any of this in the next week or so. Great. It's been my pleasure to be with both of you guys and uh, really support what you're doing. Uh, the intellectual project that you're, you're both engaged in here is, uh, is a critical part uh, to effective American foreign policy and national security. So keep it up. Thanks, Rich. Hope you all enjoyed the episode. I really appreciated how we merged both the philosophical and the heady with also just the practical implications there. So a lot of great stuff there. As Rich said, he's newly entering the deep end of the think tank policy space out of government. So you definitely go follow and engage with his work. And of course, if you want to learn more about counterbalance or the work at the Hudson Institute, go to hudson.org. Hope you all enjoyed the episode. We will see you next week.